as of now. Do you know? Okay, uh, three million. Uh, yes, it, it is three million for a money claim. If we're just talking about money claim. Um, for a divorce, um, basically you would start at the family court. The case can be transferred up to the court of first instance, but it does not depend on the money involved. It does not depend on the wealth that you have of your family. It's different. Because for a civil claim, if, it's, uh, if it exceeds uh, 3 million, automatically it's in the CFI, right? That's how you understand it. But this is not the case in uh, a divorce. That is because if you have some sort of landed property in Hong Kong easily, your pot, the whole wealth of the family would exceed 3 million, right? You can't buy a house or an apartment with 3 million in Hong Kong anymore. I don't think so. Okay, so um, where the, the court level where your family case is heard does not depend on the total wealth of the family. It depends on complexity, usually. So even if you have a super big money cases, talking about billion, if the financial structure of uh, the parties to the uh, marriage is surprisingly simple, then the family court has the jurisdiction and the experience to hear and adjudicate that case. Um, what would justify a transfer up to a CFI, uh, to, to transfer up a case to a CFI, is when, for instance, you have various trust um, devices. When you have different trust, when companies or public companies are involved, when you have complicated company structures. Um, do you guys? Um, well, I don't know that case, I'm not sure. Uh, if it's a public company is involved, well, technically, the parties would not own the public, uh, public company 100%, because it's a public listed company. Then there are issues as to how you would arrange these shares, because that would also affect public interest, the share values, so, right? Um, so in that case, it would be justifiable to transfer it up to the CFI because high court judges would have more experience in dealing with company law matters, commercial, complicated commercial matters. Mm. Sometimes the cases would be transferred to CFI because of children. For instance, uh, in a later class, I will tell you about this thing called worship. When the children are under the custody of the court, the jurisdiction is with the CFI. The family court has no power to make a child to be a ward of the family court. That's one of the possible scenario where the case has to be in CFI. But then maybe after that part, uh, if the finance is easy enough, and if the uh, worship matter is resolved, then it can be transferred back down to the district court at the family court. Okay. So the point is, it then it's not the three million that decides; it's the complexity, and uh, in certain situation, the jurisdiction that family court doesn't have. Okay, so that's the first aspect of jurisdiction you have to know. The second aspect is that um, if you want to have a divorce proceeding in Hong Kong, well, if you're a local from Hong Kong, you live here, you have your life here, there's no problem with finding the jurisdiction. Uh, it is given. But if you're here on a visa, if you are an expect or if you're only here for work if you're from mainland or if you have Hong Kong ID but you frequently travel out 
um, or you live most of your time in other places, then there is problem with jurisdictions. The issue of forum, whether the Hong Kong court is suitable to hear a divorce if you're not uh, here that often in Hong Kong. Um, again, it doesn't matter when you get married. That's not the deciding factor. What matter is that when you get a divorce in Hong Kong, whether you have sufficient ties here. To establish jurisdictions, there are three ways. You have to satisfy one of these listed conditions in section three of the matrimonial causes ordinance. The court in Hong Kong will have jurisdictions to hear your divorce if either of the parties to the marriage was domiciled in Hong Kong at the time of the petition, or either the, of the parties was habitually resident in Hong Kong throughout a period of three years, immediately before the petition, or either parties had a substantial connection with Hong Kong at the date of the petition or joint application. So three options, domicile, habitual resident, substantial connection. So what is domicile? Domicile usually arises from one's residence in a place with the intention of making it his permanent home, or it arises from its being or having the domicile of some person on whom he is for this purpose legally de dependent. Sorry, it's not defendant, it's dependent. There's a typo here. So the first type you have uh, arise, arising from one's residence in a place with the intention of making it his permanent home, it's called domicile of choice. If a person left his hometown with no intention to return, then his domicile of origin remains until he acquires a new domicile of choice. You can do it by the combination of residence in a country and the intention of living there permanently or indefinitely, but not otherwise. The intention is important. It is an intention to make this new place his permanent home. So mere residence without that intention is not good enough and the intention has to be demonstrated by actual evidence. Whereas, uh, for the second part, you can have domicile of origin. So by the operation of law, every person receives at birth a domicile of origin that depends on the domicile of um, your parent at the time of birth. So the domicile is not when you, uh, where you are born. It's when you're born, where, where your parent domicile is. So if I was born in Hong Kong, but my mom's and my dad's domicile are both mainland, then my domicile of origin is mainland China, not Hong Kong. Because it depends on the domicile of my um, well, who I, I am legally dependent on, my parents. Now for domicile, there are a few features you have to know. Domicile is a legal concept, by the way. It cannot, it's not to be interpreted in its ordinary sense. It's not like that. It has, le uh, it has legal significance. You can only have one domicile at a particular point of time, one at a time. Um, you have to have one, and there can only be one at the same time. You can't have zero, you can't have two. And um, a particular domicile will continue until you acquire a new domicile. It is a very strict legal requirement, so you have to remember that. 
Um, to determine a person's intention to make a permanent home in a particular pe place, to determine whether you have domicile, um, the case of W and C sets out a list of factors um, for you to consider. So you will have to take into account the length of residence of this um, domicile, the place you want to acquire for domicile, the condition of residence, whether it's purchased, so if it's purchased residence, and that indicates strongly an intention to make permanent home in that place, or is it just a rented place? Whether you have uh, a marriage with a local partner, where your family are, um, where is your business interest? Where are your personal belongings? Your properties, your investment, um, decision as to the nationality of your children, where your children are educated, whether you have associations with clubs, uh, religion, place of work, relationship between a man and his family. Okay. That makes sense, right? Okay. Habitual resident, it refers to the quality of residence rather than its duration. There must be an intention to live in that place in question. So the intention is to live in a place, but it doesn't have to be an intention to live there permanently. So this is different from a domicile. You only need a degree, a sufficient degree of continuity to be settled in that place. It doesn't have to be permanent as long as you intend to continue to say, stay there. You want to be settled there but it doesn't have to be indefinite. So it's not as stringent as the requirement of domicile. And um, in the case of Regina and Barnett London Borough Council, ex parte Shah, it is suggested that um, a habitual residence is a residence adopted voluntarily for settled purpose as part of the regular order of his life for the time being, whether of short or long duration. So again, a habitual resident doesn't depend on the duration itself. It depends on the nature, the quality, whether you want to be settled there for some time. Um, What is a settled purpose? It can be um, very limited, such as you want to be in a place for education purpose. That could be a settled purpose. It is irrelevant that you might have a permanent residence or a real home in other places. So for instance, uh, I was educated in Canada from a university. So for that period of time, if I wanted to be there settled in that place for a certain period of time for the purpose of education, I was a habitual resident. But I didn't acquire domicile in Canada. So for domicile, you can only have one domicile at a time, but for habitual residence, you can have more than one. So in comparison, it is easier to prove habitual residence. You don't need a permanent intention, but the intention is just to live in a place for a settled purpose, and you can have more than one. For substantial connection, that's where you can resort to its ordinary meaning in a particular context. 
So substantial connection is even wider than habitual residence. What is substantial connection? It can include many things. It's quite broad. Um, it is a preferred ground. Actually, um, when there is a jurisdiction or a forum challenge, people would usually um, resort to substantial connection because it's very wide. And um, substantial connection is a matter of fact, meaning that whether a person has a substantial connection with Hong Kong um, is a question of facts and circumstances in that particular case. We don't have a definition for substantial connection, just the ordinary meaning, how you would interpret it as of now. Okay, you look at the surrounding circumstances and decide if the person is substantially connected with Hong Kong. Simple as that. Uh, there are a few cases I've set out here. So if you're interested, you can read the last one, the ZC and CN, which has set out how the law has developed in relation to jurisdiction and on substantial connection. And then you will find references to S&S and BNA. Okay, and then considering the existence of substantial connection, because it's really wide, so you would need some guidance, obviously. Um, as a starting point, you would need to see if that person has connection here. Physical presence, that's what you usually need. And then, once you have connection, you have to consider whether the connection is substantial. It's a little self-explanatory, but you easily get confused when you have a broad term like this. Everything gets meshed together. That's why you have to consider these two elements separately. Connection, the existence of connection, and the connection being substantial. In this exercise, you would have to consider the party's phys physical presence in Hong Kong, whether the parties travel in and out of Hong Kong, the frequency, the length and purpose of staying in Hong Kong, where the matrimonial home is, where the parties see um, their home are for the time being, where their roots are, where the husband and wife work, whether there are frequent commutes, where the home base is, where are the children, if the children are studying in Hong Kong, if they're studying in Hong Kong, are they studying on boarding basis? Where they spend their holiday? If they study overseas, do they come back to Hong Kong? The party's residency status and where they have their properties and assets and money. What happened in that CNCN is this. The wife petitioned for divorce, and the husband launched a jurisdiction challenge. It is found in that case that for the past 30 years, the husband has conducted his life away from Hong Kong, but in the mainland China, where he has his business and matrimonial home. And at the time, he still lived in Shenzhen. The fact that the husband has properties in Hong Kong where he can stay while he's in Hong Kong, bank accounts in Hong Kong and a company registered in Hong Kong does not necessarily help him to establish a substantial connection here. And it's said in that judgment that it is not uncommon for someone in this modern age of globalization to hold foreign properties, bank accounts, companies, particularly in light of the close proximity between Hong Kong and mainland and the large volume of commuters ac uh, crossing the borders of mainland to Hong Kong. So even though the husband is a Hong Kong permanent resident, his travel record reveals that his entry into Hong Kong and stay in Hong Kong is really in the nature of a residence by passage only. 
It is a lot of same day returns and short overnight stays. So the husband, it was held that he did not have substantial connection in Hong Kong. So a Hong Kong permanent ID is not decisive. The fact that you have properties, monies, even landed properties, is not decisive. You have to look into the substance of the connection uh, with Hong Kong of that particular party. There is a very recent judgment. Um, it's, it's not here, so just listen, <laughs> sorry. It's called JQ and CHL. By the way, do you know why these cases are all in abbreviated letters? It's never in a full name. Do you know why? Have I told you? Privacy. So these are the initials of the parties. So if I'm a party of a divorce, it will be BH or YBH. Okay. So that's why it's difficult to memorize case names. Okay. <laughs> I'll try and see for your exams whether you are required to. Yes, but the judgment will be published. And the uh, hearings of matrimonial proceedings, except in the main suit trial and enforcement proceedings, everything is in chambers. So only the parties, the husband and the wife, and their lawyers can be in the court. You can't have a friend inside. Okay? And the registrar obviously won't review your documents. In fact, if you want to review matrimonial documents to a third party, you need to ask for permission. You need to apply for leave, and you need to justify. Um, I have done this before, and it is because um, It's a little bit complicated. Well, basically, the wife is saying that the domestic helper is assaulting one of the children sexually, indecent an assault. So there is some issue with um, on the criminal side with the foreign domestic worker, and there is some issue with immigration. So we need to tell immigration the, situ the, the background of a divorce in that family, and that's why there are all the troubles uh, with the criminal allegation and then potential immigration issue. For that purpose, uh, we need to, in order to satisfy the immigration so that the worker can stay in Hong Kong without criminal liability, we need to apply for, a, uh, for the relevant court orders with certain information deducted, uh, redacted so that the immigration has on their record what's happening in the family court. Because otherwise, you can't know and you are not in at liberty to disclose to a third party. Okay, that's why it's difficult. I don't know how many cases you need to remember for your exam. You definitely need to know LKWNDD for finance. That's the most important case law in family law. Okay, for others, I'm not sure. But anyways, back to substantial connection. Um, you don't have to write it down now. We will definitely cover it in finance. Um, I want to tell you about this case, which is currently on appeal. It's called JQ and CHL by Judge Ivan Wong. The facts are these. The husband has his business and factory in Dongguan, in mainland China, and he lived in Dongguan. So from time to time, uh, well, he has a previous marriage where uh, he had two children with his ex-wife. So from time to time, he would come back to Hong Kong to visit the children. He also returns to Hong Kong for business meetings, medical checkups, and social events. It was held that even though the husband was basically living in China, he continued to maintain a consistent economic and social presence in Hong Kong. He is not a tourist to Hong Kong, but rather his presence in Hong Kong is an unbroken continuity and is not of transitory in nature. 
nor was it a fly-in and fly-out case. Uh, it is a very nuanced finding of facts. Um, usually, you can't, you won't find substantial connection if the person is not physically present in Hong Kong and the person is not living in Hong Kong. The appeal is, I'm not doing the case, but I know that the appeal was uh, triggered because the finding was basically the husband is not frequently in Hong Kong, physically. He only comes back for uh, commercial dealings and for seeing the family, medical checkups, those sort of thing. So if that is sufficient to establish substantial connection, that, that is a floodgate opening up for a lot of litigants. That's why uh, on this point, the case was taken up to appeal. Uh, the judgment is not out yet. I don't, I'm not aware of it, but it's an interesting case that um, we'll be concerned with. Okay, so there might be a change um, with the court being more flexible in f finding jurisdiction for a divorce to be heard in Hong Kong. But that depends on the appeal of this case. So that's jurisdiction. It's not, um, you don't have a lot of content on jurisdictions in your course manual, as far as I recall. This is only the basic, the first step you have for finding jurisdiction. Because usually in a challenge on forum, um, you will be able to find, what happens usually is this, you will be able to find a substantial connection in Hong Kong and then you're also able to establish a forum in another country, or another place, should I say, such as mainland China. And then you will have a suit called uh, foreign non-convenience. So which forum is more suitable if you have two jurisdictions available at the same time? So that's where um, the substantive hearing is. This is just a very basic, the beginning phase. Okay, that, that suit is more complicated and there are a lot of procedural matters. So I'm not going to cover it in, in this class. And it's not in your course manual, it won't be in your exam for the form non convenience part. Okay? You just have to know about this basic uh, requirement for jurisdiction. So the part on procedure. Let me know if it's too difficult to understand because with my experience as a student, myself once and once upon a time, procedure is really boring and difficult to understand. You will get it when you actually practice it, but it might be difficult to, you know, by just hearing it. Okay, um, I think this part is examinable. It's in your assignment. For the petition, you, if you want to file for petition for divorce, there is a set of papers you need to prepare. The first one is a petition, form two. Ah, it's actually in your course manual, <laughs> page 83. If you want to take a look, or if you want to find a template, is it also available on the judiciary's website? Here. So you will see from this petition on page 83, it's based on two years separation. Okay, I think I have time to briefly go through. Do you all have your course manual or should I put it up? Here. I can pull it up on the computer. I think I have it.
so you will see it's based on two year separation. Ah, another note here. <laughs> First paragraph is always on the marriage, when and where you got married lawfully. Um, and then the second paragraph is basically the formal matrimonial home, where you have lived together. And then the third, you see there's, well, the jurisdiction requirement, they're both domiciled in Hong Kong. And then you'll have the party's occupation and where they live now. Paragraph three. Paragraph four, whether there are any children of the family. Fifth, now pay attention to fifth, very interesting, is that no other child than living has been born to the petitioner during the marriage. So by this sentence, I know that the petitioner is the wife. It's always about whether there is um, any other children born to the wife. So if it's a um, petition by the husband, it would be something like, as far as the respondent is aware of, there is no children living that has been, no other children living that has been born to the respondent, who is the wife. Six is there have been no previous proceedings in Hong Kong in relation to the marriage. So if you have a fresh petition based on, um, for instance, two year separation, then you will mention the previous proceedings here. Seven, no agreement has been made. That's the usual, no proposal, that's the usual. And nine, the marriage has broken down irretrievably and then it is a two-year petition, so the facts, you have to plead the facts here in paragraph 10. And you have a separation date here. If it's a UB petition, it will be much, much longer under this part, not just one sentence. Okay, and then you have the prayer. You want to dissolve the marriage. And then you might ask for uh, any orders specifically relating to children or the finance. If, um, in this case, the petitioner is the wife. Of course, she asks for things, okay? If the petitioner is the husband, usually they will offer nothing. End of story. They just want to end the marriage. It's, it's purely procedural, okay? Um, because subsequently there are other sets of document where you can make use of to make claims on uh, finance and also to ask for custody orders of the children. Okay. Um, so you need the form to the petition and then there is a notice of proceedings if you continue on the course manual and I think you have your printer PowerPoint so I don't show it here. So the notice of proceedings is just is similar to what you have in civil proceedings. It's basically saying that I'm divorcing you, and you are you should be made aware of that. It says that I'm serving a petition for divorce on you, and there are certain documents you need to complete. And then in the same set of things, you would have a Form 4, Acknowledgement of Service. That's what you have in civil procedure, right? So you would get these documents. Um, what well, you have to complete the petition, file it into the court. You would get a notice of proceedings from the court. And then there would be a blank form uh, in Form 4, because it's to be completed by the respondent. So you will serve all these things to the respondent. So in four, it asks the respondent whether you want to defend the main suit. In five, if it is a one year petition with consent, it also asks the respondent, do you really give a consent? 
in sex, if it's a two-year separation, it asks whether you have suffered any great financial hardship. That's the exception. Remember? Um, also on eight, even if you do not intend to defend, do you want to ask for the children or money? Usually you would take all these things. Okay. You can indicate you want to get all these things and subsequently drop your claims. It's all right. Usually people just take all, all of the items from A to H. So the uh, form four, uh, it's a blank form to be served on the respondent. The respondent has to file this form eight days after he has received the divorce petition. If usually they won't do it within eight days. But even if the respondent files the form um, out of time, um, but before the court uh, makes an order, makes a degree, a decision on the divorce, it will still be seen as proper filing. So in reality, if you're late in giving this form, it's okay. It just means that you will have more hearings and then adjournment of hearings. It takes longer to proceed with the main suit. Okay, and then if you go on to your course manual, page 90, you'll have form 2A certificate with regard to reconciliation. So what it means is that normally it is signed by a solicitor. Um, it's saying that um, as a solicitor, I have spoken to the petitioner. I, I have spoken to my client. I have um, told her or him about considering reconciliation. Um, but then my client does not want to re re reconcile with the other party. That's essentially what it means. And then, if you want, move on to the next page, the Form 2B is a statement as to arrangements for children. So, um, in the first part, here, you would specify the arrangement for the children as of now as of the time when you file for divorce. Where he's studying, where, uh, who's taking care of the children, who is financially responsible for the children, who the children are living with, and whether the, the children get to see the other parent, if the parents have already lived apart. And the second part will look to the future. Um, it's the same set of question, but for future arrangements. So the first part is current arrangement. Um, the second part is the your intended arrangement for the children in the future. But this is a very preliminary document, and you will have further documents to set out your plans for the children at a later stage. And there is also, if you go to page 93, There is also a um, certificate as to family mediation. So if uh, parties agree to mediate, the mediator clerk in the family court would contact the party and invite them to attend a uh, briefing session. just the formality, things you will go through. Okay? It would be better, it would be more concrete if you see a real set of documents. But, sorry, I can't show you a real document for protection of privacy of the client. Um, okay, but, but I've just gone through the important points to highlight these uh, certain parts of the documents. I hope it helps. So you have the form two, the petition, 
the notice of proceedings and then a blank acknowledgement of service to be completed by the respondent, statement or the arrangement of children, a certificate with regard to reconciliation, certificate as to mediation. And you would also have to bring the marriage certificate for filing. Uh, you won't serve it on the respondent, you don't have to. Um, you either have to file the original or you have to have a certified copy, I think. And then it will be returned to you uh, in the end. For a joint, this is for a petition, for a joint application, it's similar, but instead of a petition, you would have a joint application, it's Form 2C. So not Form 2, it's Form 2C. And um, 3 and 4 are the same. Um, for 2B, I think it would be 2D for the children. So for petition is 2-boy, for the uh, joint application is 2 dog. Okay, that's where the differences are. So once you've got those forms from the family registry and you fill in the relevant papers, except the acknowledgement of service, you have to file it to the registry with the marriage certificate and then you get a case action number and then that means you have started the legal proceedings. For a divorce, it would start with FCMC. Family Court Matrimonial Proceedings. FCMC. Sometimes you would have case action called uh, starting with FCMP. That means the case is at the family court level, but it's for miscellaneous proceedings. So for certain applications for children, when there's no divorce, uh, then it will be FCMP. If, uh, for example, if it's a proceedings under the guardianship of minors ordinance. So if it is if the case is transferred up to the High Court, the FCMC will become a HCMC, indicating it's High Court level. And the miscellaneous, um, correspondingly, would be HCMP. Because okay. I think for civil, uh, in High Court, it's HCA, usually. If it's PI, then it's PI. DCPI, HCPI. For divorces, it's MC, matrimonial courses. Just FYI. So, the, so after you get the case numbers and then you have those things stamped on your papers, the next thing you have to do is to serve the papers onto the respondent, either by hand or by post. Now, it says you have to uh, have personal service but significantly for a petition, you can't personally do it yourself. I don't know why. You have to ask a friend. Okay, or you do it by post, or you do it by a solicitor. If it is done by post, it has to be posted to the respondent's address or if you don't know where he lives now, to his last known address, or to the address of his solicitor, if you think he has one. So that's civil procedure. The difference is that you can't do it personally, personally. You can't do it by yourself, okay? So deem service. If a Form 4 is signed and returned and the signature is proved at the hearing, the petition is deemed to have been served. But if the Form 4 is not returned, you would have to file an affidavit saying that how the service was, um, how it was done and you believe that the respondent has had documents. Usually, if you have a, if you engage a firm, then uh, a messenger a clerk in the firm can do that affirmation for you.
if the petition is served personally and the form four is not returned, then you need to have an affidavit saying that the server firstly knows the respondent and he also has to state in the affirmation how he has identified the respondent and served the papers on the respondent. Okay, is it clear? Substitute service is um, when the petition fails to reach the respondent, um, you can have substitute service by way of advertising in newspapers with approval from the court. You have to seek, you have to seek leave from the court because the default is that you have to serve it um, personally or by post. But then if it can't be done or it doesn't reach the respondent, the respondent doesn't show up with a Form 4, then you can ask to, you know, by an alternative method, notify the respondent by uh, advertising in the newspapers. And then after that, you need to have a copy of the advertisement in the newspaper and then exhibit that to an affidavit saying, uh, and father into court, saying that you have done the substitute uh, service. Or when even substitute service is not practicable or it is necessary or um, it's necessary to dispense with the service, um, then with leave, the service can be dispensed with. The way to do it is by way of an ex parte application with a supporting affidavit. Now, if the respondent wants to defend the suit, he would indicate that in the form four. I think that's uh, answer four in the form four, which I just showed you in your course manual. He has 21 days to file an answer to the petition. So the answer is basically the defense to the petition. He, is also, uh, he also has the option to file a cross petition for defense, uh, for divorce. Okay, and the petition will be set down in the defendant list for trial. If um, a main suit is defended, it will be done in open court. Do you know the difference between open court, in chambers hearing, um, and in chambers hearing, bracket, open to public? No? Have you, have you learned it in uh, civil procedure somewhere else? So traditionally, we will have uh, open court hearings and in-chambers hearing. Uh, open court means it's the public is free to come and observe the court proceedings. So when you have barristers, they will, ha uh, they will be in wig and gown. And also the judges will also be, uh, be in their appropriate court attire with wigs and their, their gowns, judiciary gowns. Um, in the old days, in-chambers hearings are conducted in the office of the judges. It's called their chambers. That's why it's called in-chambers hearing. These days, they are physically conducted in the courtroom itself. It's not at the back of the judge's office. Um, most of the family proceedings are in-chambers, bracket, not open to public. So only the parties themselves and the lawyers can come. If you really, really, really need a friend, you need to justify and ask for leave for the court to have that friend inside the court to support you. It's really rare. It's really rare. Um, if it's in chambers, bracket, open to public, then the public can come and observe the proceedings as well. But then we don't have to be robed. We don't have to wear our wig and gown. Just in suit is fine. For main suit, it's in open court, so it's wick and gown situation. Um, there's also in enforcement proceedings, will be in wick and gown, 
But otherwise, basically all of the other matrimonial proceedings are in chambers, not open to public. Closed door. Well, the only exception is that the securities can go inside. They get to hear all the stories, just like the judges and the clerk. Okay. Those securities are really nosy, by the way. Uh, if a main suit is not defended, then so if a form four is returned and the respondent says that I'm not going to defend it, then the petition would be set down in the special procedure list. Now, in that case, the petitioner will have to prepare an affidavit in support of the petition in Form 21, Bracket 4, where you will exhibit the completed Form 4 by the respondent saying that he's not going to defend it. And that is because um, even if it is not defended, the petitioner will still have to prove it. It's a matter of procedure. Um, if you want to turn to page 104 in your course manual, it looks something like this. It's uh, an affidavit by the petitioner herself. Okay? So it says, so you have that petition, whether you want to change anything, um, is everything true? And then uh, the separation date, main reason for separation, the circumstances where you have come to, come to the conclusion that the sole ground for divorce um, has been satisfied. So it's like an easy one or two sentences you will put here. And addresses. whether you have filed the relevant document for the children, any alteration in the document, and at page 106, at the very top you have paragraph three. I identify this signature, something, appearing on the copy of Acknowledgement of Service, now produced to me and marked A, exhibit uh, marked as A, as the signature of my husband, the respondent in the course. So in that form four, it should state, uh, I do not intend to defend the suit. Okay, so that's how you prove the petition for divorce. And uh, if the registrar is satisfied with that proof, then it will make and file a certificate Let's go back to the slide. The registrar will file a certificate following this Form 21, bracket 4. Um, and on that certificate, um, a day will be fixed for the pronouncement of a decree signed by a judge in open court. Uh, it is, there's a date for hearing, but it's a hearing you don't have to attend. Uh, what you will see is sometimes in the court list, you will see that um, there is a special procedure list that a particular judge has to do on a particular day. So what actually happens is that nobody would come for the decree nisi hearing or the absolute hearing. The judge would be working in chambers. The courtroom door is shut. The judge is there <laughs> to sign things. Okay. Nobody will be in the court. It's just a matter of procedure. And you would have that uh, decree nice date. If there is a notice of intention to proceed with an application for, and now you have it here, ancillary relief in the petition or in Form A. So if you want to get money, uh, financial provision from the other party, uh, usually the wife, let's say, um, then in your petition, usually you will ask for it. You will uh, set it out in the prayer part. But if you are the husband, 
um, or or if you are the party with more wealth, then obviously you, you won't provide for it in the petition. Then what can be done is that the other party who wants to get the money can file a Form A to ask uh, to indicate that you want to apply for financial provision. So if there's such an application uh, for ancillary relief for finance, then a first appointment hearing would be fixed. First appointment hearing is basically um, a, a case management hearing for the main suit and for finance. And then the notice of a first appointment hearing is in Form C. Form C can be found on page 102 in your course manual. It's just a notice of hearing. Okay? And if, they, uh, if, the two, if there are any children of the family and the children matters are in dispute, then you will also get a notice of a children's appointment hearing in Form I. Form I can be found on page 158 of your course manual. Just a notice of hearing, okay? You can look into that later. So six weeks after the pronouncement of uh, Decree Naisai, if there's no objection, then the petitioner may apply by notice for the Decree Naisai to be made absolute. The notice is in Form 5. And um, if the petitioner, the petitioner does not apply for uh, a decree absolute after six weeks, then the respondent can do so. Decree absolute is when you are legally divorced, as I said before. I still don't quite understand exactly why you need a nice eye and then an absolute. So don't ask me that question. Uh, but in practice, there is a significance with, um, there is difference between decree nice and decree absolute. Because you can't make a lump sum payment order for the spouse without a decree absolute. And you can't make a financial order without a decree NISI. So before you get a decree NISI, you can't have a final financial order. But if you want to make a lump sum order for financial provision, you have to wait for the decree absolute. The last thing you need to know uh, about Decree Absolute is this, what we call the Section 18 Declaration. A final order in a divorce must have a Section 18 Declaration if, uh, well that is because the court is concerned with the interest of any children of the family. Without this declaration, a Decree Absolute would be void. So what does it say? Okay, if you look at part A, the declaration can say that um, the court is satisfied that there are no children of the family to whom section 18 applies. Or it can be a declaration that the children of the family, namely somebody, somebody, are the only children of the family to whom Section 18 applies. And the court is satisfied that arrangements for the welfare of uh, the children of family so named have been made and are satisfactory to the court. Or there's also a declaration that it is impracticable, impracticable 
for the parties to make such uh, an arrangement for the welfare of the children. Uh, the last one is rare. I haven't seen it. Usually, well, when there are no children of the family, you will have a declaration as in A, to say that there's no uh, children of the family involved. But if there are, then um, there needs to be arrangements of these children, and the court are satisfied. The court is satisfied with such arrangements. Okay, so you, you have to have this section 18 declaration before you get a decree nice, uh, a decree absolute. So arrangement will include arrangement with uh, custody and care, and perhaps financial arrangement as well. It depends on the cases. Okay? That's all for today. Do we have any questions? Sorry for keeping you that late on a Friday night. I hope it's all clear. Okay.